Okay, we're in chapter 13, and we have baccalaureate today, and I have to, so we have to let class out early, because they tell me I have to be over in the other building, putting on my regalia at 1030, so we'll have to quit here in about an hour. So how in the world are we going to talk about all this stuff in chapter 13? In the next hour, all the stuff that's left here. Uh, page 520 is where we left off. And <clears throat> it talks about development, pollution, and the quality of life. Development has a lot to do with monetary income, <clears throat> simply providing people with a way to make money because if they can earn some money, they have money to spend to buy the things they need, hopefully to improve the quality of life. It doesn't always work out like that. In some cultures, once people start getting some money and they're no longer living on a subsistence kind of existence, they don't use the money to buy school supplies for their children. <laughs> They use the money to buy alcoholic beverages and get inebriated. You know, it's just, it's just, it's like there's not always uh, when when you work with someone to help them. Uh, got you, Drake. When you work with someone to help them develop their economy, it doesn't mean they'll always use their economy for the right kinds of things. I still think, like I said the other day with water, that. Clean water is important enough to where we need to do it, even if, like, uh, on Wednesday we we're talking about those water wells, and, and uh, I looked up when I got home water wells in Africa, problems with water wells, and I couldn't believe all the problems that result from drilling water wells in Africa, but there are just tons of them, and uh, in my mind it's like, okay, what we need to do is stop doing the same thing over and over and over and start doing things like you mentioned before class uh, drill the wells far enough away from the village where they'll have to walk like they normally have which is what they're used to doing but also it gets it away from all this pollution in the village too so people don't throw things in the well to pollute it but since we don't have since we only have an hour to finish this chapter and I have a whole bunch of topics here on my little card that this chapter talks about. Uh, on page 520 and 521, uh, developing the economy, developing a quality of life, addressing pollution. There's some things that we take so much for granted in this country Gotcha, Adrian. Um, I mean, it, it's not necessarily a fun topic to research or read about, but uh, we just take having toilets for granted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go watch my grandson play baseball, and even if the baseball field's out in the middle of nowhere, there will be one of these Two, one or two or three of these little metal buildings called porta potties. I know it's not the most appealing thing to use, but it's what people do in America. I was shocked when I was in France. <laughs> they they actually have little restrooms. But people, the custom in France isn't to use a restroom. Just walk up to a wall and go to the bathroom. And it's like, no, no, don't tell me that my ancestors did stuff like that. <laughs> yes, my French ancestors did. And it's, and it's pathetic. And it, when you read about India, it's really sad that people don't have toilets in their homes, they don't have toilets in their communities, so after dark they just walk out into the middle of the field and go to a bathroom. And 
it's it's like what so understand there's just a lot of pollution going on in the world that that we don't know anything about in this country and then in terms of water quality here uh, you just want some water you take your water bottle you go to the tap fill it up and drink it do you do most of you do that I mean, why spend money to buy a new bottle of water when you can just fill your bottle of water up from the tap? <coughs> because in other countries, the tap water isn't healthy to drink. It'll, um, it'll make you very sick. And my wife found that out when she let the waiter at the restaurant in Athens, her water bottle was empty and he said, I'll fill that up for you. She said, oh, thank you very much. And I said, no, no, I don't think you want to drink that water he's bringing back. She goes, well, I don't want to offend him. So she drank it, and by the time our airplane got back here to the States, she was so sick she couldn't even walk. She was just crawling on her hands and knees across the floor because she had picked up some bad water. And when I traveled to Brazil, every place you went, you drank bottled water. And I just think we take a lot of things for granted in this country. So anyway, to expedite the use of our time, I googled efforts to solve global problems. And look at the first one that popped up here. Eight steps to solve the ocean's plastic problem. Are you all aware of the plastic problem in the ocean? That out here in the middle of the ocean where the currents kind of circulate, there's this huge mass of plastic because it floats, it's accumulated, and it's bigger, I think, than the state of May, or, or the state of New Jersey or something. It's a huge, or Massachusetts, it's a huge mass out there, and they're talking about how can we solve it. And here's guy says, well, I've got eight steps to do it. But you know what it makes me think? Just like, in, have you noticed in some places where you buy a bottle of water, it says like in Hawaii and someplace else, there's five cents? that you have to pay for the bottle and then you pay 20 cents for the water. Mm -hmm. Did anyone ever live someplace where you had to pay a deposit on the bottles that stuff came in? <coughs> they used to have a nickel deposit on glass pop bottles, soda bottles. And what do you think some of us kids did if there's a nickel for each bottle for people who didn't care about the nickel and they drank the pop and threw it away. We would go pick up the bottles, take them to the grocery store and cash them in. I mean, if you have to work an hour to make a dollar and 20 bottles will earn you a dollar at the grocery store, you don't have to work an hour to find 20 bottles thrown out in the grass along the highway from people drinking and throwing them out. So. In a sense, that deposit was solving some of the throwaway bottle problem by simply saying somebody else is going to pick it up and uh, take it to the store to, to redeem it and get the money back. What's this next one? Efforts to solve global economic issues. Uh, there was a lady at our church who went to India, kind of like on a mission trip because she was buying stuff that was made in India and selling it here in the States. And she connected with a, a lady who actually had a ministry to, uh, what's that other problem we talked about that some of you put on there? Um, enslaving women. Human trafficking. Human trafficking, the problem. People in India were enslaving women, <clears throat> and this lady started a ministry to help rescue them <coughs> from prostitution, <coughs> from being enslaved by these people, but then they needed a job, and they started making things, and this lady got in touch with her and started selling them here in the States, and so she went over there to teach them some sewing skills and to help them with it, but she said what got her started doing this is she started looking to see where the stuff she bought came from and then researching to see what kind of labor was used to make it. And if they were taking advantage of people, 
then she wouldn't buy those products. And she started looking for a way to buy things that are made someplace where the people have a, a decent living. So basically it's trying to solve the economic problem of people being taken advantage of and we're buying the products so they keep enslaving them. And the other one is people need a living so we're looking for ways to create an opportunity for people overseas and, and undeveloped countries to make a living. Stopping global warming, all kinds of solutions to that. Let's just not burn so much coal. And remember I suggested that when we went through that chapter on how we get our electricity in this town? Let's just tell KCPNL to turn the electricity off for 12 hours a day and then that'll cut our coal use in half. So which 12 hours are you willing for them to turn the electricity off? Turn it off in the daytime because we have sunlight to see to get around but turn it on at night so we'll have lights. Then if the electricity was turned off here in the daytime, what would happen in this classroom? No laptops would be working? Say so yes they would, they'd run on a battery. Your battery would run down and you wouldn't have any way to charge it up. We wouldn't have any lights in here, we wouldn't have the video, we wouldn't have the computer to turn on. So sometimes, as a guy said last night talking about this tariff thing with China, he said, it's a, it, the way China is taking advantage of us is terrible, but sometimes the easy, what seem like simple solutions to put a tariff on them doesn't really solve the problem either. And, and so it's like turning the lights out probably wouldn't solve the problem. In fact, if we turn the lights out half of the day, <coughs> if KCPNL said in order to save on uh, global warming, we're going to turn the lights off half the day. I know immediately what I would do. I would go out and buy a generator. You know what I'm talking about? That I hook up to my house. And so then I would be burning gasoline or propane to run my generator to put electricity in my house so I can have electricity when the city doesn't provide it. So solutions for climate change. What are you going to do about the changing climate? Okay, first you say, what's causing the climate change? And the question to answer that, some people say, hey, it's just natural cycles we're going through. And others say, no, it's because we're cutting down all the forest in the Amazon. And it's disrupting the whole weather cycle. And I don't know what the answer is. But what do you say? We tell them to quit cutting down trees in the Amazon? If trees are part of the solution to uh, solving the global warming problem, then all of us should be planting trees everywhere to improve the quality of life. And you say, well, what about in big cities where it's all concrete? <clears throat> so it's time to tear down some of the buildings and plant some trees. See, we don't have to... Now, see, I can make that recommendation because I live in Kansas City where we're surrounded by all kinds of trees. And the people in Oklahoma would say, that's easy for you to say, it's hard to make trees grow down here. I'm going, yeah, I know. But we've got trees everywhere. All you have to do is just let your grass keep growing. I have a little pasture as part of my house, but I don't have anything on it. And I don't have any animals out there. And it's amazing. Trees just start growing in this part of the world. If you just let land go long enough, the trees will just take over again. International environmental problems, global issue, overview, United Nations, disaster relief, education. That's page one, let's go to page two. economic issues, global warming, solving global warming. It's not easy, but it's not too hard. So many good things to read. Japan contributes to efforts to solve environmental problems. So what's Japan doing? It's a small country. 
planting forest, and guess what else? Getting most of their electricity from nuclear power plants, nuclear power plants. Remember that one that got hit by a tsunami and got shut down and contaminated a bunch of things? But at least they're doing something to solve the problem. The food crisis in the world? What are we doing to solve the food crisis? It used to be years ago when America had a big surplus in crops. Like, let's see, what happened now? Who did, what did I just read? Because of the tariffs in China, because of the, the United States just this week has put some tariffs on imports from China, China has said, we're not going to buy wheat from America. So, whoops, there goes uh, some income for the farmers. Well, guess what the government used to do? The government used to buy that surplus wheat from the farmers to maintain the price for wheat, and then they would give that wheat away to countries that didn't have any food. So they could take the wheat and make bread. Sounds like a good idea. So the wheat would be put in railroad cars, taken down to the coast, put on a ship, taken overseas, sometimes put in bags. And then the wheat would get overseas and sometimes by the time it got there, water got into the ship and some of it spoiled and some of the wheat when it got there was delivered to people and it wasn't usable. And sometimes the people who were unloading the ship and supposed to distribute the wheat to the people who need it <coughs> would, would sell it to some other country. They were just stealing the wheat and making money with it. So solving the world's food problem, um, I mean, I'm thinking, even if we said in our little world, we have all these people who are hungry, we have all these fast food restaurants that throw food away, tell the fast food restaurants to quit throwing food away and give it to all the hungry people. Wouldn't that solve a problem? I'm thinking it would. Then why don't the fast food people do that? What would happen if somebody kept a hamburger that McDonald's gave to um, some hungry people to eat and they let it lay around too long and ate it after it had outlived its shelf life and got sick? Any idea what they would do? What happens in America when um, McDonald's makes their coffee too hot and somebody drinks it and burns their mouth? Sue. They, sue. <laughs> they call a lawyer and sue McDonald's. So it's like, guess what? These people don't give food away <clears throat> because <clears throat> the people who are ought to be thankful for a gift turn around and sue them. Well, any other global problems here? What's this global priorities? I don't know. Ten personal solutions to global warming. I bet you know what that means, don't you? We come in here in the dead of winter, and it's uh, cold, and somebody says, turn up the heat. We come in here when it's getting warm, and somebody says, turn on the air conditioner. What could we say personally to solve some of the global warming problems that are caused by using too much energy, you, too much coal being burnt to make too much electricity to keep this room warm or cold. We'll just turn it off and just be a little uncomfortable. No, I don't think so. Global health issues. I just had a missionary friend who's coming back to the States for a few months, and he said that the medicine that he has to buy in Brazil will cost 10 times as much when he's in America. So he's thinking about buying a, like a year's supply of the medicine and bringing it with him in a suitcase. And he said, pray that we'll get through customs. Why would he have trouble getting through customs? If he has a year's supply of his heart medicine, what? his customs probably going to think he's going to do with it. 
take it to America and sell it. Let's go to page three. See what's on page three. How many pages? What are the ten biggest global challenges? Well, let's look at that. That must be interesting. What are the ten biggest global challenges? Food security? Do any of you ever go to bed hungry? Because you don't have anything to eat? Or do you always keep a little stash of snacks around just in case you get hungry, you've got something to eat? Do we all have a little stash somewhere? You just go to bed hungry? I don't eat. Oh, man. I get ready to go to bed at night. This shows you how spoiled I am. And I say, I'd sure like to have a bowl of ice cream. And my wife says, well, we're out of ice cream. You ate the last of it for supper. What time is it? It's about 10.30 at night, Tom. Well, I'm not going to bed hungry. <laughs> I get in my car and where do I go? Eli's. <laughs> who's open 24 hours a day and who sells ice cream? Walmart. That's exactly right. I drive up there and I go in and buy some and take it home and eat a bowl of that stuff. Oh, and look at that. On the way home, I went by a McDonald's that's open 24 hours a day. Well, I might as well buy me a $1 cheeseburger while I'm here, too. Maybe a cheeseburger and a bowl of ice cream will keep me from getting hungry tonight. Am I the only one that lives like that? I mean, do you understand? Do you understand there are people who, who don't have that option in the world? We're thinking on the world scale. And, and even people who live in our community, <coughs> who live out under a bridge, they don't have the money to go up there and buy it. Although I did say the other day, some of those guys that are asking for money or smoking cigarettes, I'm thinking that they need to quit smoking and start buying groceries. What's the next problem <laughs> listed here? Rising income inequalities is causing all kinds of economic and social ills. Income inequality. When you see rich people spending money like crazy and you don't have any money to buy something, do you see that kind of starts to grate on people? And they think, are you finished with it? Just bring it up here and lay it on top of my briefcase. Thank you very much. Extracting class. You have a good day. Yeah, thank you. You too. Economic growth. What kind of jobs are you guys going to have? You don't know. Unemployment. How about that? Okay. You say, I don't know what kind of job I'm going to have. Isn't that interesting? In this country, we say, what kind of job are you going to get when you get out of school? Or what kind of job are you going to get for somebody? You say, I don't know. What if somebody said, there are no jobs? It's like, what? What? When someone tells me I can't find a job, I say, so when's the last time you went to apply for one? Well, a month ago. Well, there you go. If you want to go to work, you just don't you just keep going up and down 58 Highway about every three days, checking to see if anybody is interested in hiring you to go to work for them and you just keep doing that till you find a job say no I asked a month ago and nobody wanted to hire me well that was a month ago you ought to be doing it every week in fact I told a friend of mine who was having trouble his son said he couldn't find a job and I said does he spend if he's going to work eight hours a day when he gets a job does he spend eight hours a day trying to find a job and he goes no He's waiting for a job to come to him. And I'm saying, well, as long as you keep feeding him and housing him, he'll probably keep coming home to roost. If you want him to go to work, get in the car, take him someplace, and keep going till he finds a job. I actually did that with a relative one time. It wasn't a job. It was, they were living in our house and said they couldn't find a place to live. And 
after about three weeks, I said, you know why you can't find a place to live? And they said, why? I said, because you're too picky. So guess what? This was on Wednesday. I said, on Saturday, you and I are going to get in my car and I'm going to find a place for you to live. I'm not as picky as you are. You have between now and Saturday to find one on your own. And if you don't, on Saturday, I'm going to find one for you. Any idea what this person did? Found a place. They found a place. But until I kind of gave them an ultimatum, I said to Anina, I said, Tom, that seems so unkind to a relative. I said, Nina, we would have that relative living with us for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Do any of you have relatives like that? That yeah. they, would just, they would just stay and take advantage as long as they want to live? <coughs> you have to help them learn to be responsible. Climate change? Pictures of how the climate's changing? That will help a little bit if it doesn't get quite as cold. If it gets too hot, we'll need more air conditioning. No, we could live without air conditioning. I know you can because I lived without it for a long time in my life. Natural resources? Are we using up some of our natural resources? Yes. Yes, we are. What can we do about that? If there's no more wood to build houses, what will you build your houses out of? What do they build houses out of in Kansas City if they don't build them out of wood? Have any of you ever seen a house built out of concrete blocks? Yeah. I'm telling you. Have any of you ever seen a house built completely out of stone, just dug out of the ground? Rocks? I mean, in this part of the country, rocks just work their way to the surface. You collect enough of those, and pretty soon you've made the ground where it would be productive to plant a garden, and you keep collecting those rocks, and pretty soon you stack them up, put them together, and build a house out of them. The global financial system? What is that? Have you ever heard of people putting their money in the bank and then going to the bank to get their money and finding out that the guy who owned the bank stole it and moved to another country? Or in Venezuela, people are saving money. <laughs> you can't afford to save money. Inflation is so rampant in Venezuela that uh, it's, it, it makes saving the joke. Financial insecurity. What's the future of the internet? You go, what? Say, hey, we just get on here and Google stuff and look for it. Can you do that in every country in the world? Nope, they don't have the freedom to do that. What's the future for gender equality? Your book talks about that one. It's on page 559 at the very end of this chapter. It talks about uh, women being empowered. It has an index for country, countries where women are treated more equal with men. It has, I think, the top 20 countries or the top 10. And is it the top 10 or it must be the top 20 and the, the lowest 20? And do you see the United States on that list? If you don't, what does that tell you? that there are 20 other countries that are doing a better job with gender equality than we are in our country. You go, how do you figure? Well, has England, because England's on there, has England ever had a woman who was the head of the government? Has the United States ever had a female president? There you go. You understand that we're not, we don't rank as high as other countries for gender equality. You go, well, it's just because a woman hasn't run for that office. Oh, is that what the women will tell you? Ask a woman about that stuff. Did you know there was a lawsuit against Walmart? because women managers were paid less than men managers who did the exact same job? Did you know sometimes in schools that happens? Men who work in a school get paid more than the women. And guess what the rationale is for it, ladies? You're going to like this one. 
the, the woman has a husband at home who has another good paying job whereas if you're a man in the home and that's your major income you ought to be able to make more money than a woman who's working here part time and I said to the guy who told me that I'm sorry but if you're paying me for the work I do and the woman does the same kind of work and caliber of work I'm doing she ought to earn the same money you all agree with that? Yes. Well, maybe since we all agree in 20 years, when all of you are in charge in the world, it won't be a problem here. And the United States will be listed in the next book they publish as doing something about gender equality. Global earnings. Are all of you aware that uh, Americans are the richest people on the face of the earth? not just the rich people in America, all of us. Even the people who make what are called poverty salaries in America are by world standards considered wealthy, which is pretty unusual. And the rest of the world goes, how come we can't be like America? And since the other country isn't like America, the people from those countries, and if I live in another country, I'd be the same way, What's the quickest way for me to get to America and cash in on the promised land? Global trade and investment. The president and China are having some disagreements about global trade. So uh, it's going to create some problems. And China has invested a lot of money in America. It could be that they'll start selling their investments. Oh, I heard something about something happened in New York City. Some foreign countries were buying real estate in New York City and because they were selling it to a foreign country, they were inflating the price. So when the foreign country felt out of favor with the United States, when they tried to sell it, they lost money on it. And the people who sold in the building said, that's life in America took advantage of it. International trade and investment. You want to invest your money in a foreign country? Would you be happy if you had some money invested in Venezuela? If, you, if you're an oil company, all those big companies we talked about the other day, uh, and if you went to Venezuela when they were friendly toward America and said, hey, we'll drill an oil well for you if you pay us a certain commission on the, a certain percentage of the oil that we pump out of the ground, they said, sure, we'll do that. Then the next thing you know, they elect a new president who doesn't like the American company making all that money, and they say, guess what? We're going to nationalize the oil industry in Venezuela, and you guys are all out. Well, well you're going to pay us for it? No, because you already made too much money. We're just going to take over, and you're gone. And Venezuela did take over, and now their oil industry is falling apart because they don't know how to maintain it. Infrastructure, you know what infrastructure is? Highways. Have any of you ever driven in a country where the roads aren't maintained? And yes. I was actually riding in a car in Brazil where we're going down the road and you know we, they, they put pictures on television of potholes in Kansas City in the winter time You've never seen a pothole like we saw. It was like it was like in the middle of the road. It was bigger than the whole road. And the guy just kept going. And I thought, he's not slowing down. We're going to hit that big hole in the road and crash. And he came to the road, and he did this. I couldn't believe it. He, As soon as he got to the edge of the pothole, he, you know, like a roundabout, he, he dr turned his wheel and drove around the outside of the pothole and out the other side. Oh, you've seen that. Yeah, I've lived, lived that. Another... I've lived that. <laughs> okay, I've lived that. And it's just like, whoa, whoa, we think a pothole's a problem here. We haven't seen a pothole until we go to some other country. So the, the roads, the railroads being maintained, the highways being maintained, but there's another part of infrastructure too, and that's the water system where the pipes that the water comes through that goes to our house and the sewer pipes that takes the water away from our house and the electric system 
where the wires that bring electricity to our house and the underground pipes that bring natural gas health care that's a big discussion going on now and what can you do to help other countries solve some of their health problems I mean there really isn't a reason for measles to be a problem in the world is there if we have stuff here that doesn't cost much that we give to all the children so they don't get measles so why don't we just pack up that uh, medicine and take it to the rest of the world <coughs> like we were talking about how people in the rest of the world perceive what we're doing did you know in some countries people are told don't let them squirt that medicine in your arm it's part of an effort to enslave us they're poisoning us I mean it's amazing some of the things that people say that uh, keep them from doing some of the good things that we offer people in other countries also watch like really bad movies that Americans make like about like how rich people kill other people mm -hmm. and like like the really bad movies that not even we want to watch yeah and they're, they're like oh this is what Americans do all the time See, and, and so that's, then they act like they're shooting each other. Isn't that scary to think that what a lot of people think of us is what they see in movies? It, we also think that of a different countries. Whatever we see in social media. That's or, right. Or movies, that's what we think about that's other right. countries. Well, for example, I lived in Oklahoma, and I have some cousins who live in Baltimore, and they grew up there, and they came out here to visit, and the first question they ask is, where are the Indians? <laughs> I said, what? They said, the Indians. I see them on cowboy and Indian movies. And in fact, I don't know what it does to you, but if, if I ever see one of those old cowboy and Indian movies, I can't watch it. Because it's just, it hurts too much. It's too offensive to me to see the way they portray Native Americans and the way they portray cowboys cowboys are gunslingers and Native Americans are going around scalping people none of that's true are, were there some gunslingers and were there some people scalping people yes but not like some world population we saw that clock didn't we? we studied population so what do we do about world population guess what happened a few years ago some people were so concerned <clears throat> actually here was the way it played out the concern is that we're going to overpopulate the world and not have enough food to feed everybody so we need to start doing something about controlling population growth and guess what the solution was by the uh, great minds in America we need to go to other countries where they're having too many children and stop them from having so many children Another guy suggested that why don't we just, since we have enough earth to grow plenty of crops, why don't we just teach people how to be better farmers so we can produce enough food for as many people as they're born. And some of the birth control measures that were proposed around the world are pretty sad. Well, let's go back and see what else we have here. Education, global issues in education. Have any of you seen what schooling is like in some countries? Yeah. And they call that a school? Mm -hmm. My best friend over there was 13 years old and was in sec third grade. And we take, don't we take education kind of for granted here? What's the next one? World refugee crisis. Does this surprise you? Over a million people have left Venezuela during this crisis that's going on. 
and gone across the border to live in Bolivia. In Colombia too. And, and they don't have any way to take care of those people because of refugees trying to get away from a bad situation. Could these innovations solve the global water problem? Increase access to clean water in developing countries? A number of creative technologies. Well, let's look at those creative technologies. Could these five innovations help solve the global water crisis? <coughs> A drinkable book? Graphene filters, fog catchers, solar crops. It looks like they have a solar panel running a pump that's pumping water out of the ground, doesn't it? Well, the Guardian's just got all kinds of good ideas. How Solution 17 can solve the world's most pressing problems for a sustainable future. Solutions for deforestation. Quit cutting the trees down. Okay. Have any of you seen a place? Oh, did you hear this? Okay, you've all heard about the fires in California, right? Did anyone hear this? If they would have been harvesting some of those trees, when those fires broke out, they wouldn't have spread like they did. But because they didn't want those trees harvested, they let them grow. Have any of you seen a place where you'll see trees growing and some of them get old and die and just become like a torch waiting to happen? Mm -hmm. And the idea is that Probably we should be harvesting trees, but when we harvest some, we should be planting some back. And where there has been deforestation, let's get back in there and get trees growing again, but do it in a healthy fashion. In a way that makes the land healthy. Solving world hunger means solving world poverty. Or teaching the world how to raise crops teaching everyone how to raise a little garden. International, let's go up to page four. How many pages are there? The global crisis of plastic pollution. Why is plastic such a problem anyway? <coughs> What do you do when you're finished with a plastic drinking bottle? Recycle it. You just throw it away. And where does it go? If you throw away the wrapper to your McDonald's hamburger, does that wrapper eventually disintegrate when it goes into the garbage pile? Have you ever seen what happens to newspaper when it's left in a garbage pile? It breaks down and turns back into soil. Do plastic bottles break down and turn back into anything? No. Once you've made those plastic bottles, they're there until somebody decides to collect them and recycle them and make something else out of them. And in Raymore, where I live, they gave us two trash cans. One is for trash for the trash dump and the other one is to be recycled and they tell us what to put in the recycled barrel and I just read recently that the trash companies aren't telling you this but they have one truck comes by to pick up the recycled stuff and another one to pick up the trash but both trucks have been hauling stuff to the same dump because the companies that used to recycle things 
have more than they need and they're not buying any more plastic. But we're still using plastic. So it just goes to the dump. And talk about plastic. Well, I found out I can't put my Walmart plastic bags in the recycle bin. The recycle people don't want Walmart plastic. There's something wrong with it. It can't be recycled like the plastic bags from Target and Price Chopper and Hy-Vee. And I don't understand that one, but they're just saying that's part of what's happening. So probably we're going to have to address this thing of plastics and anything you buy anymore. What? Everything is hanging on the rack encased in plastic. And all of that plastic probably needs to be recycled. Solving world hunger. Global health. Ah, international <coughs> drug trafficking. And trafficking in the people. Is there any more added here? How many? World hunger, we've talked about that one. Plastics. I'm looking at that Redmond students explain efforts to solve the world's problems. I'm a little bit amused by schools who have third graders sit around and figure out how to solve the world's problems. If the adults in our world can't figure out a solution, I doubt if the third graders are going to come up with a good one either. But could we have third graders think of things they could do to address plastic pollution? Yeah, instead of throwing your water bottle away and getting a new one, take your water bottle and refill it and use the same bottle over and over and over again. When I buy orange juice from the grocery store and it comes in a plastic bottle, then after I empty the bottle, use it for a water jar. You, you follow? Find other uses for this stuff. Talk about things we can do to save in some small scale. Okay. <coughs> I think maybe we've gone far enough. You can just keep running through this stuff and reading it. Let's just turn it off. And let's try to cover the rest of this book in the next 10 minutes. Page 522 talks about trading wealth for environmental quality. Doing something to say, I'll give up some of my wealth so that I can improve the quality of life. Which means I'll pay more money for something that comes in a plastic container so we have the money to recycle the plastic containers. Page 523 talks about malaria and DDT. Have anyone ever lived someplace where they had uh, problems from malaria? I got it like three times. And how come we don't have problems with malaria here in Kansas City? Because you don't have the mosquitoes that carry them. We don't have the same and and have you ever seen the summertime when we've had a lot of rain and pools form to and mosquitoes start to breed? The guy from the city is out with his little sprayer doing what? Killing the mosquitoes. Yeah. I don't know what he's using to kill them with, but I can tell you this: Have any of you heard of DDT? We used to buy it in powder, pour it in a big bucket. It looks like chalk water stuff. It turns milky white. And then we would, my dad would tell us, actually when we were younger, he, he'd say, boys, the weeds are growing in the fence along the pasture. You need to go cut them down. And he would give us two long knives where we would go down there and spend the whole day whacking weeds down. Once we discovered DDT, he said, boys, you need to get rid of those weeds again. We'd say, okay. And we would dump some DDT in a bucket, put a pump in it, and we would take turns. One of us would drive the truck, and the other one would just go spraying DDT in the fence row. 
by the time we got to the end of the pasture and turned around and came back, the weeds were just wilted. That DDT just killed stuff. In fact, we thought if it kills weeds, when the flies are bothering you when you're out in the barn milking, let's just go out in the barn and go psh, psh, spray DDT everywhere. We sprayed it on the cows so they wouldn't swish their tails around and hit us. And I still remember milking a cow one time and watching DDT drop from the cow into the milk that we took in the house and drank it. <laughs> Never thought a thing about it. Maybe that's why I have allergies today and health problems. Because you know, well, you know why we banned DDT in this country? Does anyone know what prompted the government to ban DDT? Eagles were dying off in America because the DDT that we were spraying would wash down into the streams. The eagles would eat fish that were full of DDT and it would damage the shells so their eggs wouldn't hatch, the eggs would break. And so they said, our national bird is in danger of becoming extinct and it's all because of DDT. So they banned DDT so we don't use it anymore. Other countries don't have the same respect for the eagle, so they still use it. I can't believe we did stuff like that. Page uh, 525 talks about global warming and reforestation on 526. We've, we've already seen some websites on that. Page 528 talks about global security and human rights. What's global security? Making the world a safe place for people to live. What are human rights? I just saw, I just saw it on the news. A guy in Kazakhstan went out in the middle of the square and held up a white piece of paper that said nothing to show people that you could get arrested for holding a placard up in the square even if there was nothing written on it. And sure enough, the police came and arrested him. He had a friend videotape it, and, or you know, take a picture of it and put it up on the internet. And everybody's looking at it and thinking, what kind of country is that? It's a country where you don't have very many human rights. That's what it is. On page 531, it talks about some of the special agencies uh, that the United Nations has. There's a whole bunch of them there. And they're all created to address specific problems. And you can look at those and just see a whole list of organizations, special agencies from the United Nations. <coughs> Nuclear disarmament is also mentioned on page 531. Getting people to I mean, nuclear energy can be a, a clean source of electricity. It can also be a clean source of blowing up other nations. So somehow we have to get a handle on uh, nuclear weapons and turn, turn that stuff into producing electricity. Page uh, 532 talks about national sovereignty and humanitarian intervention. Right now, there's a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Well, guess what? We could solve that problem in a minute, couldn't we? I mean, don't we have enough people in America and enough money in America where we could go to Venezuela and just move in and say, look, here's medicine, here's food, we'll help you build a new government. Oh, by the way, the guy who's your president, he's gone because he was bad. He created the problem, so he's out of here. Any idea why we can't do that? Or any idea why we won't do that? Who's, who's supporting the leader of Venezuela who's created all these problems by the way he's managed the country? China and Russia. <coughs> Why are they supporting him? Because we oppose him. You, you follow? 
this internet, this great big global thing that's going on between uh, these superpowers having differences and they, they express their differences by who they support. And, and it is a problem. Sometimes you have to disallow a nation's sovereignty for the sake of helping the people in a humanitarian way that live there. And who makes that judgment? And it's something we better be careful about. In fact, I think that judgment was made by Europeans in America when they said, guess what? It would be best for all the Native Americans to live on a reservation in Oklahoma. So we Europeans can take the rest of the land and cultivate it and make this a wealthy nation. Page 834 and 835 talk about two problems that were a problem when this book was published, Serbia and Iraq. Do you know anything about Serbia and Iraq? It's probably been so long ago. But do you know anything about Crimea? What page? Page 534 and 535. It talks about Serbia and Iraq, but do you know? Do any of you know about Crimea, where Russia took? It would be similar to Russia saying, "When we sold you Alaska, we didn't know there was all that oil and gold up there, so we're taking Alaska back." Would that create a problem if Russia said that? Would we probably have a war with Russia? Oh, yeah. Okay, so how come when Russia took Crimea from Ukraine, why didn't they have a war between Russia and Ukraine? Ukraine is a tiny little country that didn't have any military power because they were under the USSR. And when the USSR fell apart, they gave up all of their military to get help from the European Union to be a stronger nation. So they didn't have any power. So when Russia took uh, Crimea, there wasn't anything they could do about it. In Venezuela, there's a crisis. And... So far, it's not being solved. In North Korea, there's another crisis going on. And in both of those countries, Venezuela and North Korea, the people who live there have all kinds of humanitarian needs. But there's a few people in power who have more concern for maintaining their power than they do for taking care of the people. Page 5. 37 talks about NATO. Are you familiar with NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? Well, if you study about it, it's, uh, it's a bunch of countries in Europe who uh, have asked the United States to help protect them from being invaded like happened with Germany. And we said, yeah, we'll do that. Well, now what's happened is when the USSR fell apart and all of those little satellite countries started taking an interest in becoming NATO countries, now the president of Russia thinks that the United States is using, his, is using their NATO alliances to uh, take over Russia and push us, in, in fact, what some Russians would say is America wants to push us off the face of the earth. The same kind of thing that we say about Arab nations want to push Israel off the face of the earth. And even if we don't want to do that, still, that's the perception on their part, or at least that's what they say. And so, so they get nervous about NATO. So some NATO country says, hey, since Russia took Crimea, protect us so Russia won't take stuff from us. And they said, okay, we'll be there. And then Russia says, yeah, you're going to use that as a pretense to invade Russia. Uh, the European Union on page 539. Uh, 
NAFTA on page 543, and in the USSR on page 552, the CIS. What's CIS stand for? NAFTA's North American Free Trade Agreement, 552. CIS is, what does it say? The Commonwealth of Independent States. It's kind of like Russia says, if you can have NATO, we can have a Commonwealth of Independent States, which are countries that used to be part of the USSR, but they do business with us. And why would anyone do business with Russia? Because they sell them goods and services at bargain prices. Okay, I know I'm a little late getting over there, but we're going to have to quit, and I have to go.